evening. Uh, I'd ask that you uh, join me in the Pledge to the Flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We're glad you're with us this evening. Um, moving on to the roll call, please. Mrs. Fryrick? Here. Mr. Desai? Here. Mr. Posnow? Here. Mr. Robinson? Here. Mr. Sanders? Mrs. Schrader? Here. Mr. Sears? Here. Mr. Sullivan? Here. Mr. Tillman? Thank you. Uh, and this is your friendly reminder to please silence your cell phones during our meeting. Moving on to public comments. All comments and questions will be addressed to the board president. Board and staff members will not normally respond to comments or questions during the meeting unless recognized by the president for this purpose. Comments will be limited at the, at the discretion of the president to five minutes or less. Any takers this evening? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to uh, action for our board minutes. Uh, approval of the minutes of the regular monthly meeting conducted February 27th, 2023. Are there any comments or corrections to those minutes? If not, uh, those minutes can stand as submitted then. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's my duty as board president to state that the board met in executive session at 5.30 p.m. on March 13th, 2023, as permitted by Section 707 of the Sunshine Act for the purpose of discussing legal matters. No official action was taken. Dr. Krauser, Superintendent's Report. Thank you, Madam President. Good evening, everyone. Um, a few items this evening. I did have one guest join me to go over a few items. Uh, the first item is the administration recommends the board approval of a confidential administrative discipline hearing for student ID number 21458061164, following a hearing conducted by our board appointed hearing officer, Dr. Lorfink. The agreement sets forth the details of the recommendation in response to the violation of the York Suburban Code of Conduct and an Act 26 violation of the Commonwealth of PA. I'm seeking a motion on that, please. We can do a unanimous roll call vote. This will be considered a unanimous roll call vote unless I hear votes to the contrary. Hearing none, motion passes. Thank you. The second item I have is the administration is recommending the board approve the dual credit affiliation agreement with the Pennsylvania State University to provide dual credit coursework for certain qualified York Suburban student high school students. This agreement shall commence an effective date and shall continue for the period of five years. And I'm seeking a motion on that too, please. Any discussion for Dr. Krauser on that? If not, then it can be a unanimous roll call vote as well. This will be considered a unanimous roll call vote unless I hear votes to the contrary. Hearing none, motion passes. And just as a side note, uh, in preparation, Dr. Ellison High School team uh, in, in that dual credit affiliation agreements, we're preparing. This will be uh, a recommendation for seven total of next year. This We've done through a few of those already. Just kind of as a review, we have Harrisburg, Hack Campus on there. Tonight was the Penn State. We have York College, Pennsylvania, Harrisburg University, uh, and Mansfield, which is a combination of a couple uh, universities when they consolidated. Uh, and then the University of Pittsburgh, which we use as our college in the high school world language programs. Um, and we also have the Pennsylvania College of Art and Design. So those are the seven affiliated agreements that we've been working through with the high school. So we appreciate your efforts on that um, to provide a robust opportunity for our high school students. The third item that I have is the following policy that we've been discussing. Uh, there's a recommendation for their second read with the intent to be a vote at the end of March. We've added the edits that were discussed last time, and those policies uh, were prepared for a second read. Any questions from that read? Any discussion on any of these policies? I, I, I found one, and I'm, I'm not sure it's on the, the very first one. 
um, the the very first sentence um, on copy the copy of principles for governance and leadership. Mm -hmm. um, Pennsylvania school boards are committed to providing every student the opportunity to grow. Let me just make sure I'm looking at the right one. Is anybody is anybody with me there? Yeah. No, I think she was referencing 011, the principles yes. of governance. Yeah, yes. I, I looked in the uh, second one in the list. Oh, it's the second one. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Um, I did pull that directly from PSBA. I know that our own uh, very own Ms. Fryer was part of that process. Um, let me double check that language. I just thought the sentence yep. seemed clumsy in my, you know, wording might, yep. uh, inserting the word to, T-O there might, might clarify. Sure. Um, Two plus a verb is an infinitive, I believe, in my remembering my old school English. Well, he, 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 he uh -huh. wanted to read, you want, I have two here, you don't want the two? No, I don't have a two. Here. I have a two in mind. The, the, the opportunity, the opportunity, grow and achieve. It reads now, Pennsylvania school boards are committed to providing every student the opportunity grow and achieve. It looks it, it looks to me like it was a misprint. Let me confirm that with PSBA to be certain, but based on the way that's written, I think it is a misprint. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the one we're just we just received from PSBA that once approved will be able to, yeah. Yeah, I'm just yep. looking at the as as they were, you know, on the agenda, the link there. I just wanted to yep. in respect to have it be coherent. Thank, thank you very much. And, and and there is the value of the of two reads with multiple eyes. Uh, when we read it multiple times, knowing what we think it should say, it's uh, editing. One of those great skills we learn in yep. the education yep. process. Thank you. In anything, anything else? Any any comments or edits for any of those uh, nine policies there? If not, then I guess we'll the end of March. End of March, correct. Thank you. And the last item that I have, always a pleasure to to welcome and introduce Mrs. Jenkins to join us this morning. Um, last month when we were reviewing the policies, one of the policies that we did a first read of that is currently on pause, um, the state of Pennsylvania, um, PSBA and, and our local solicitor began the process of combining homelessness uh, and foster care in the new language under educational instability. Um, that policy, we began the first read, then we received some updates from that. So we did pause that read, um, but always an opportunity to get Mrs. Jenkins to join us to answer any questions relative to homelessness. And in particular, there was that uh, request to help us define homelessness. My response, a very vague and uh, ambiguously written definition for a very specific reason. So I asked uh, uh, Mrs. Jenkins to join us. So I'm going to turn it over to her to kind of address some of those comments. Good evening. There's a lot of people here. Um, but yeah, so I, I want to give you guys the time to ask me any questions, kind of interpreting the law and the definition. But I wanted to give you the, the very long, comprehensive definition of what it means to be considered homeless under the McKinney-Vento Act, um, which is part of the Every Student Succeeds Act, which, um, you know, the Government recognizes that there are a lot of students and children that are living in some sort of transition or unstable housing. So the definition itself is the term homeless child and youth is defined as individuals who lack a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. Those are the three words that are most important, the fixed, regular, and adequate, um, including children and youth who are sharing the housing of other persons due to a loss of housing, economic hardship, or a similar reason, living in a motel, hotel, trailer parks, or a camping ground due to lack of alternate adequate accommodations, living in an emergency or transitional shelter, abandoned in a hospital, living in a car, a park, a public space, abandoned buildings, substandard housing, bus or train station, or similar settings, sleeping in a primary nighttime residence that is a public or private place not designated for or ordinarily used as a regular sleeping accommodation, um, any of our migratory students, and then any child that's considered unaccompanied. And basically that means is a child that is not in the physical custody of a parent or guardian. In practical terms, this means the youth does not live with a parent or guardian who is in a transition as defined above. That's a whole lot. 
but that's the very complex, probably over-defined definition. So I, um, when it comes to homeless students, parents really have the um, say-so in regards to what their housing situation looks like, which is why every school in the state of Pennsylvania has a homeless liaison. That's myself. To really kind of navigate the nuances, um, are they eligible for McKinney-Vento services or are they not? Are they truly displaced or are they stably housed? Um, so they really kind of get the, the leading, if you will, deciding if it's considered homeless or not. Um, anytime that I would disagree with that recommendation, they have the opportunity to file a dispute. I could file the dispute. Um, the parents could refile a dispute, and then it goes up to the regional coordinator to make a decision, and then if they don't make a decision, it ultimately goes to the state. Um, it's a little bit different than like our Act 1 kiddos or our foster care because in a foster care situation, um, the school district and the children and youth worker kind of have the, the say-so in making that determination. But with our homeless children, it's, it really kind of stems from um, the family and what they determine to be the best interest for their child. So I'm happy to answer some questions or if you need any additional clarity, um, I'll kind of turn it over to you guys. Anything for Mrs. Jenkins? How often are disputes filed? Um, rare. Since my time here at York Suburban, I, I do like a really diligent background and home visits and conversations, exploratory, you know, um, information before like I really make a decision. Um, I've only had two while I've been here at York Suburban, um, and those were more due to like a residency issue where families were utilizing an address but not actually residing there. Um, so that requires just a lot of home visits, a lot of follow-ups, a lot of check and connect. Um, but I usually try to resolve it so it doesn't reach that level. I knew you were going to ask that, so I came with some numbers. Um, so active currently right now, we have 47. Um, but throughout the course of this school year, there's been 53. Um, which I actually think is really good. Myself and my other uh, social workers, I can say that now, um, have worked really diligent to, to try to rehouse families. It might not be in our school district, but finding the funding, utilizing resources to establish safe and permanent housing, um, which has been really good. So. Uh, if, if I'm being very honest, I would love to have one person designated to be our homeless liaison to work with these families like really intensely. Um, but weekly, I would say, every day I'm making a phone call, checking, you know, is this family actually residing there? Are they in transition? Um, constantly switching up transportation. They may get with, be with a, a relative and there's a dispute that happens in that residence and then they're moving in with an aunt or um, they're living in their car and the grandparents are no longer allowing them to utilize the shower or their apartment in cold weather, so they're going to a different campground. Um, it's kind of constant day-to-day -day work. Um, I usually try to divert some of those kiddos that are elementary or middle school to the new social workers to do that case management piece, um, but it is definitely a part of my day-to-day -day, um, job and conversation about our, our homeless youth. Yeah. There's a lot of legwork involved in, um, number one, making those home visits and establishing if they are truly transient. And then there's a whole other load of, you know, helping them maintain employment, utilizing an effective budget. Do they have financial security? Um, finding safe and affordable housing is, is incredibly difficult. Um, a lot of the funding that comes through the state to, like, the next door housing program, they run out of money very quickly. Um, the waiting list for the housing authority isn't even open to get, you know, low-income housing vouchers. So we really are kind of in a little bit of a hole um, trying to find safe, um, affordable places for families to live. I mean, yeah, because it, it, um, it depends. Funding is always exhausted quite quickly, and when they look at um, funding cuts, they always take away from the, the support services, the social services first. So, you know, every year is a, a different year based off of the state budget and what money is allocated to those resources. But then to Mr. Sears' point, they take the money away from that budget, but then it falls on the dist school district. Mm -hmm. Talk, talk, repeat what you were just saying in terms of this, this family you, you know to be homeless. You, you help them with job, budget. Go, run down that list again. I, I, I find that to be amazing. 
Yeah, so the idea is um, typically families who are in poverty, it's, it's systemic, right? Like it's often that, you know, when they were raised, there's not been stability holistically. They might not know how to balance a checkbook. They might know, not know how to um, maintain gainful employment. So we really try to work with on, you know, what is a realistic budget on something that you can afford? Um, your rent, your utilities, food. Um, and working with them on, okay, what kind of job or what kind of source of income do I need to be able to maintain that? Um, by just kind of housing them or just throwing some there, you know, really, really, what, what are we teaching them? Like, my goal is to empower our families to be self-sufficient long-term. So if they're moving, I want to make sure that wherever they're moving is sustainable to, to provide that family stability, but also to provide that educational stability so these kiddos aren't bouncing around from house to house to house, friend to friend to friend. So we really try to holistically support the family, not just kind of putting them in a place and kind of saying, all right, see ya. Um, it's kind of that follow-through day-to-day. Thank you. Ellen. How often you, you, you said something that intrigued me, that sometimes they, you locate them in another school district. Does that then become District B's issue? You give them all the paperwork and say, here they are? Or is that a last resort? Or Yeah, so it's really what's in the best interest of the child. Typically, if we have families that move in, um, and the way homelessness works is you can, you're considered homeless if you're displaced for one evening. Right, like they're allowed to utilize the protections under the McKinney-Vento law. So a lot of times we'll have families that come in in August, um, don't have stable housing, or they, you know, um, are transient and all over the place. So we might have them enrolled, or they remain enrolled until they can establish some some more permanent housing. Typically, if it's after the new year, um, I do not recommend that a kid enroll in the district where they're moving to because we've already been through half the year, three quarters of the school year. Um, at that time, then in the summer, I would reach out to those families and encourage them to enroll in the district where they're currently residing. Um, that law is really effective if they've established permanent housing. Then they have to move, like they don't have a choice. But they do have the right to finish out the remainder of the school year. If a family comes in in September and they're very transient, in October they establish housing, then I usually make the recommendation that they enroll in the district that they're residing to establish in their community because it's the beginning of the school year. So it really just goes into some history with the family, what really truly is in the best interest of the child, because that's really the person that we're trying to protect. Um, and then we kind of help support the family holistically from there. A lot of moving parts. Yeah. <laughs> Transportation is also a big piece of that. Um, oftentimes they're waiting, you know, weeks, depending where they're at, um, just to the limited number of drivers or a van's not available, um, so sometimes I'm, you know, just trying to get them to school or we might reimburse with gas cards. Anything that we can do to get the kid to school every day, I think, is really super important. Yeah. Students, I'm going on the premise that with uh, a population between 47 and 53 families, uh, all the members of the families have experienced, in addition to the economic and residential instability, some challenges to their mental health and mental stability, yeah. especially on the part of the children. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a lag time in being able to get services for those children? Yeah, um, I think mental health services just keep getting worse. Like the one program that I relied on was uh, True North, our mobile crisis response team, to be able to kind of triage those families. And the, on March 31st, they're no longer providing that resource. So we're in the in York County, we're really down to two um, resources that I can utilize for urgent emergency mental health interventions. Um, and it is a double-edged sword, right? Like, we can't have mental well-being and physical well-being until we provide, like, basic needs. And that's somewhere safe to live, food in your belly, um, and people that love and support you. Um, we have a huge population of students that have parents that are incarcerated. We have a huge population of students that um, the only place they can afford is living in a hotel or motel. And, you know, that's just kind of bleeding money. They're not really investing in something stable. Um, so... We have kids that are, you know, living in their camper and, and you know, roaming around the development. Um, I have a kid that I've just found out recently that relocated to Gettysburg. They're in a camping ground. So families are really trying to utilize whatever they can just to keep their families safe and warm. Thank you. Welcome. Anything else for Mrs. Jenkins? Thank you. Always enlightening when you visit us. I think it's very important that we continue to hear from you. I think these are things that we need to be cognizant of, so thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Jenkins. I think you and Mrs. Campbell, if you need to sneak sneak out, you can go ahead and take care of that if you need those 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 sneak times. So thank you again. You. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Mrs. Ciccioli, Business Office. Thank you, Madam President. I have three items for uh, discussion for tonight and vote on the March 27-23 meeting. Uh, the first one is a linkage agreement uh, with the Pennsylvania Comprehensive Behavior Health Services for Outpatient Psychiatric Clinic and Intensive Behavior Health Services. This is an annual uh, agreement that allows us to make referrals. The second um, motion is for a recommendation to approve uh, the tuition agreement with New Story for a student at a daily rate of $330 beginning February 21st through May 31st. Any questions for Mrs. Ciccioli on either of these two? Speak up. And the uh, third item is an agreement uh, staffing terms and conditions to assign uh, and an assignment agreement for U.S. staffing services. This allows us to get a temporary uh, LPN uh, to serve in our buildings. Um, as you know, we have been struggling with finding a health room assistant. Um, this does not uh, remove our obligation to uh, post and recruit for this position, so that position is still posting, and Mrs. Campbell and her team are still uh, interviewing to secure a full-time health room assistant. I have a question. For the last two, they're dated before we would vote to start. So one's February 21st and the other one's March 13th. So the education agreements uh, come as we place the students, uh, so we really don't have any control um, over when those agreements come in. Uh, the third one, we wanted to ensure that we had a um, an HRA as soon as we could. So um, we were okay with making that, that recommendation, approving that recommendation on behalf of pending this meeting. Thank you. So those would be approved retroactively? Yes. Anything else? Okay. The last item is just informational, and that's the February 2023 dining report. Thank you. Kylie's here for our student representative report. Yes, so the musical had a successful few shows last weekend. Um, Naley Ierly, one of our girls wrestlers, placed fourth in the My House Girls State Championship over the weekend. Girls basketball had the first round of states this weekend, but sadly lost to Mars. The girls swim team placed second in districts, and many of our other swimmers made it to districts as well, with two ladies placing in second, one placing fourth, and the boys relay team placed eighth, and five girls are at the PIAA State Championship tonight for swimming. Tyler Adams went to the state tournament for wrestling this weekend and placed 12th in the state. As our winter sports are finishing, our spring sports are beginning. Boys tennis had their first scrimmage today and won. Our new athletic director, Mr. Corsi, is doing a great job so far. And for music, Alex Bien earned first chair at the PMEA Central Region Orchestra Festival and is going to states. And Rebecca West earned fifth chair. And YSEF is having a fundraiser at Mod Pizza next Wednesday, March 22nd. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Kylie? Lots of outstanding things going on with the students. Lots of those state opportunities and the musicians. So that's that's awesome. As I often say, that's that's why we're sitting around this table, why we do what we do. So thank you for bringing us that good news. Moving on to committee reports. Uh, Mr. Robinson, Personnel Committee. Thank you, Madam President. Item one, the administration recommends the board approve a personal care assistant at the rate established in the York Suburban Educational Support Association. May I have a motion? Any discussion on that? If not, then that could be a unanimous roll call vote. 
This will be considered a unanimous roll call vote unless I hear votes to the contrary. Hearing none, motion passes. Item two. You have before you the personnel report. Would any board member like any of these items considered separately, or are there any questions on any of these items? If not, the chair moves approval of the below mentioned items. Do we have a second? Second. Any Mr. Chairperson. May I just add that the support staff day rate uh, for substitutes are as followed. Custodial staff, custodial uh, su substitutes are at $14 an hour, paraprofessionals are at $10 an hour, and administrative assistants are at $13 an hour. Thank you, Mrs. Chichuli. Ellen, yep. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, the new director of accounting, when are they... Uh, going to be starting. We have an official date. Uh, Mrs. Butler will start on Monday, May 8th. Thank you. Any Anything else? Any other questions? So we have a motion and a second. If there's no further discussion, it can be a, a unanimous roll call vote. This will be considered a unanimous roll call vote unless I hear votes to the contrary. Hearing none, motion passes. And before I conclude my report, Madam President, it is my pleasure and my privilege to introduce Teresa Callahan as learning support teacher at the high school, effective at the start of the 2023-2024 school year. And I'm also pleased to say that Teresa Callahan is with us in the audience. Welcome. Welcome. With an appropriate attire for St. Patrick's Day, must be a relationship between the name. Ms. Callahan, if you'd like to say any words, the floor is yours. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I just want to thank everyone. I really appreciate the opportunity, and I'm really excited to be coming on board. And we're pleased to have you. That concludes my report. Thank you. Uh, Oh, Ellen? Just one other thing. Uh, Jane Hoffman is going to be uh, retiring after, I think it's an amazing 34 of her 35 years with York Suburban. And I think she is to be commended for that and thank for her service. Absolutely. Thank you for pointing that out. 35 years at the middle school level? Yes. <laughs> um, that deserves a service ribbon. <laughs> Uh, I, I would also just like to recognize there are a number of volunteers who are listed in this report. Um, volunteers are a crucial part of what we do, and uh, hats off and thank yous uh, are in order for, for those individuals uh, as well. Moving on to the legislative report. You're still on, Mr. Robinson. As has become customary at board meetings such as these, I would like to defer to my friend and colleague, Mrs. Fryrick. Mrs. Fryrick? That's because my report is, is so... Well, I don't need... <laughs> this, this is short, short and sweet, that's for sure. You have before you the highlights of the March 7th uh, LIU uh, board meeting. They're always interesting because they're rather comprehensive, they tell you, uh, who has joined the staff and, and uh, lots of good things going on out at the LIU. The Joint Operating Authority for the LIU, which is charged with taking care of the York Learning Center, which is the old uh, Central York uh, School Building, um, is due to meet very shortly, so I have no report there. And the light of my life, York Adams Academy, I'm pleased to say that we continue, that we have the highlights from our February 28th meeting, as well as we continue to keep 15 of our 15 seats filled. And we found out uh, the other day that we have 20 students ready for graduation already. Uh, we're anticipating getting probably between 40 and 50 graduates for our spring graduation. That concludes my report, and I thank you, Mr. Robinson. Always a pleasure, Mrs. Fryrick. May I proceed, Madam President? Absolutely, please. Thank you for the opportunity. Well, legislatively, as we all know, the governor proposed his budget. To the surprise of no one, he listed education as a priority with uh, inclusion of career paths, increased wages, and mental health supports. Sadly, and much to my dismay, there was no provision for charter reform. And on that heading, 
we have been in touch, or I have been in touch, of my own volition with Representative Carol Hill Evans to start uh, discussions on how we might persuade and educate members of the legislature and the chief executive of our fair state on why no charter reform should not be an option going forward for our Commonwealth. In other news, 375 will require schools to have automatic defibrillators at all interscholastic events and a sudden cardiac emergency action plan. Senate Resolution 48 urges the inclusion of 2% milk in our public schools. Senate 387 allows school districts to, uh, to excuse a student for two mental health days a semester without an excuse. And finally, 7389 requires bias training for public and private school teachers. And in closing, I am pleased to inform all of you that the Senate Education Committee will be meeting on the morning of March 15th. I'm sure all of us will be glued to our live streams watching our legislators in action. And on a related note, I am pleased to say that Mrs. Jenkins will be hosting a session of Let's Talk this coming Wednesday at the middle school cafeteria, and the subject will be THC nicotine vaping. For all of those of you in our audience, what's that hand signal? Next Wednesday. Next Wednesday. Wait, is this the third Wednesday or the second coming up? This is the third Wednesday, is it not? You saved my life, Mrs. Jenkins. <clears throat> I stand corrected. Next Wednesday, not this coming Wednesday. But if you want to show up this Wednesday and just talk things over, do it anyway. And if there are no questions, that concludes my report. A question, Mr. A question for... <laughs> I don't think there's been any detail on this $100 million block grant for men, uh, mental health services in public schools. The number $100 million was in the budget. I just wondered if there was any details to share. They, they gave a breakdown on the basic and special ed financing by school district. Just wondered if there were any parameters on this. There are uh, some estimates on the PDE website. I can provide that to the board at the next meeting. but. Those are probably preliminary until... Yeah, I just wondered if there was any attempt to put some yeah. detail to that. Thank you. And I would add, Mr. Sears, as Mrs. Jenkins pointed out earlier, when the meat cleaver comes out in budget negotiations, social services are always the first to go. So if that $100 million makes it through, it'll be a red-letter day for our state. Now that concludes my report. Anything for Rich? Thank you. Uh, where are we? Uh, Mrs. Chichuli, York Adams Tax Bureau. I have no report. And I have no report this evening for the School of Technology. We'll meet later uh, this month. This brings us one last time to uh, recognize our visitors, all of those that have uh, taken their time to attend this evening. We appreciate your being here. Uh, you have a, a link, board members, to upcoming events, um, the next committee meetings and board meeting schedules are uh, listed there in your agenda. And this is the last opportunity for public comment. Any takers this evening for public comment, please uh, state your name and address for the record. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me uh, to make some comment. My name is Sarah Reinecker, 1101 Farquhar Drive. Across the state of Pennsylvania, school districts have entered their budgeting season. For the district's finance director, this means balancing the operations of the current 2022-23 school year while simultaneously crafting the 23-24 projected budget. Budgets of school districts are not a bottomless pit but they do clearly speak the priorities of any organization. As a parent volunteer who has been intricately involved in the school district for over 20 years at many levels, please allow me to offer a chronological backdrop that will lead up to thoughts about your consideration 
during this year and next year's budgeting. In 1994, that's 29 years ago, serving as the Executive Director of Downtown Inc., I attended a national conference and the keynote was David Rusk. I returned to York and built coalitions across the community to fund bringing David to York. After a two-year process, the Rusk Report was published in 1996. What's my point? I learned many things from David Rusk, the most important of which carried through the next 29 years of my advocacy for public education. In 1995, while driving to a meeting, I asked David the biggest hurdle York would have to face 20 years from that point after completing his study. He said to me this, Sarah, the concentration of poverty in York City schools is experiencing, York City is experiencing is unsustainable. And because of the way schools are funded in Pennsylvania, they will eventually implode on themselves. In about 20 years, your immediately contiguous school districts will start feeling the heat. Their test scores will change. The student population will change. And no one will put their finger on what is happening. But the wealthy school districts will fight to keep their individual tax liability the same. And it will take a while to embrace the necessary change agents that will have to be made in their school budgets to accommodate the changing student population. Let me say as a sidebar, the recognition of the broader York County community's responsibility to serve the students of York City is for another day. And it is not only York City School District's challenges that have brought the change to York Suburban School District. In 2008, continuing on the chronology, I was part of a team of community volunteers that founded the York Suburban Education Foundation. In 2015, I became its president. And in that same year, worked with Dr. Denise Furman, who was the AP at the high school at the time, and Josh Carney, a local engineer and a YSEF board member, to start the Impact Foundation, a student-led committee of YSEF. This was in direct recognition of David Rusk's prediction only 12 years later. The student needs were clearly changing, and as a volunteer community, we were interested in involving students in raising private money to assist the growing students' needs. YSEF's mission is to fund the extras, things that school district budgets do not or cannot prioritize. While the Impact Foundation was building impact closets in each of the district's six buildings as its startup and starting a weekend food backpack program to serve food insecure students, the school board was contemplating the need for its first social worker. The job description for the position was approved at the June 2018 school board meeting by a vote of five to two. Two of the members were absent. Or cannot prioritize. Understandably, school board members are faced with tough decisions based on what they understand to be the priorities of the school district at the time. Miranda Jenkins, then Miranda King, was York Suburban's first social worker and she was hired by that fall. Continuing on the chronological order, in September of 2018, Josh Carney and I met with then Superintendent, Superintendent Tim Williams and Miranda Jenkins to discuss how the Impact Foundation could best serve her new position. The needs of the student population continued to grow. In March of 2020, two years later, COVID. And the Impact Foundation volunteers began working to open a food pantry operated out of Luther Memorial Church next to the high school. Its current volunteer manager is here, Kathy Penzola. 
She's been there since the beginning. In 2020, we were feeding six to 10 families a week, COVID. Three years later, the pantry is averaging 63 families biweekly, impacting 163 children at every distribution. The needs of the student population continue to grow. Throughout this same period, through ESSER grants, money available through the COVID Relief Act, Relief Act that is federal money. Am I right about that? It's federal money and it flows through the state? Okay. The school district hired a second social worker to concentrate on the elementary level buildings. That meant at, the at that time, one social worker funded through the school district budget, Mrs. Jenkins, and one funded through a grant attached to funding that will end. At the January 23rd, 2023 school board meeting, continuing with the chronological order, the school board voted unanimously, unanimously, to approve Brianna Durr as the social worker at the middle school, and currently Tara Hansen is a third social worker working under a contracted grant funded through ESSER money, money available through the Federal COVID Relief Act. That contract ends June of 2024. That means now two social workers funded through the school district budget and one through a contract that funding will end. The fact that this vote was unanimous indicates to me that there is progress toward this school board's understanding that students' needs and education are not solely based on traditional pro priorities like math and science. On February 20th, 2023, I attended the school board property and finance meeting to hear the administration's rollout of the 23-24 budget overview and priorities. I was reminded during that meeting that while districts begin to craft the next budget, the first round large budgetary shortfall is not a surprise. In fact, it brought back memories of 20 years of attending the same meeting as the district faced the reality of a large shortfall early in the budget cycle. But every year, embracing the priorities of the day, the district has gotten us there, even through COVID, far, far from any defaults or serious impact. Last week on March 11th, Gina Trimmer, the adult volunteer chairman of YCEF's Impact Foundation, sent an email to 47 adult volunteers close to the IF operations. Tara Hansen, the contracted position social worker who is charged with elementary school level social work, was bringing a YS homeless family from a hotel into an apartment to stabilize their housing. How fortuitous that Miranda was here tonight. And I swear to you, I did not look at the agenda before I came here. I didn't know she was going to be here. Where was I? Tara? Okay, so Ms. Tara is stabilizing their housing. If, if you could wrap it up. Yep, thank you. The family of seven had nothing, literally nothing. By Monday, the email came Saturday. By Monday, four beds, a living room, furniture, bedding, pillows, toys, food, kitchen items were donated. My garage is full of an apartment worth of goods to be delivered this week. This is just one story. What Tara organizes in a day's work is unbelievable. I could say the same for Miranda. We've worked together since 2018. Calmly, with an em empathetic, caring, yet practical reality that we should all desire to emulate. But really, she's just living out the culture of this school district. Which brings me to my final point. Thank you, Lois Ann. Thank you, Mrs. Schrader, for your graciousness. 
The chronological overview is only one tiny story to try and connect some dots. There are thousands more demonstrating how this district, its staff, and the community has responded to ever-changing needs of students. It demonstrates the school board's growth when contemplating the priorities of the school budget. It demonstrates this school district's continual commitment to work with our community to prioritize and embrace the changes over time. It recognizes this district and the community's belief that equity in education means leveling the playing field for all students to have access to schools that will allow them to learn and thrive in all aspects of their educational experience and our willingness to change with the times, to be inclusive regarding of a child's economic status, their race, their gender and sexual orientation, or their religious beliefs. York Suburban is special. This is why Scott and I chose to, in, to educate our children in this district. Thank you for perpetuating this progress. Finally, I'll be back in March of 2024 when you start that budget process to advocate that you build into the budget a third staff social worker after the ESSER contract ends. And now, after hearing Miranda, this evening, perhaps a fourth to assist the homeless population. This district needs that, and I have confidence this board will prioritize it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments this evening? Again, I think this, Mrs. Reinecker's comments just uh, underscore the importance of uh, what we do and echoing the, the need that I mentioned earlier, the, the gratitude that we have for our volunteers. So anything else for the good of the order this evening? If not, then we can stand adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>